when I was a kid, I was six years old, I had a fascination with ants. I mean ants. I mean, they're some of the most amazing creatures when you think about them, right? Both as individuals, they punch way above their weight individually, but as a group, amazing how they can get coordinated and move mountains. Um, and not only that, they can get from point A to point B seamlessly by working as a team. And so at six years old, when I used to go to the park with my friends and my friends would go and you know, get on a swing ride and, and things like that, I used to find my way into the grass and find these ants. And we all know it's really easy to find them because all you have to look for are the ant, ant mounds. Right? And you find these ant mounds, it's amazing how they would form these things like little volcanoes, the ants come in and out, bring in their food down to their community, down to their family, their shelter was there, pretty impressive. Um, and then I would realize to myself, you know, what in the world are these ants thinking? Like, look at where this is sitting. It's out there so vulnerable. And, and I would get frustrated and say, you know, how can I protect all these different ant mounds? And I couldn't because whether the groundskeeper came along with their lawnmower or whether one of my friends skipping along innocently decided to knock it down, or even if it was just, you know, my dog uh, not really paying attention and just being curious, poof, the ant mound was gone. But what was pretty cool and about how the resilient these ants were, not to be denied, is all it would take is a week later for me to come back to the park, and there it was again, the ant mound, built again right back there. And then I would sort of say to myself, wow, it's just going to get knocked down again. And, you know, I used to get frustrated for them. And then I realized, even at six years old, like, there, you know, there's something to be said by doing the same thing again and again, right? There's a person who came up and defined that a little bit in terms of what happens if you expect a different outcome from doing that. Um, and then I've got sort of this consolation, and, I mean, the feeling of a good feeling that I'm a human being. I'm not a lower organism like these ants. I'm a learning organism. And so isn't it great to be a human because we'd never make those mistakes like ants, right? We would never do that. So here we are, you know, decades later, and you know, I'm focused on, this, on many things, but climate change is top of the list for me right now. Uh, and spent a lot of time on that, and in, all of us, we can turn the news on, on any given day, just within the United States, let alone worldwide, you can just have literally hours of footage on, on the television in terms of the impacts that we're seeing in terms of disasters that are coming as a result of climate change, right? It's pretty, pretty prevalent. You know, whether it's the fires like I just showed or just looking at storms coming through, uh, knocking things down and causing all sorts of flooding. And unfortunately, sometimes it's not just Mother Nature. Sometimes we as humans make bad decisions to go into war. Like this is a slide of Russia and Ukraine um, that's, that's relatively current. Well, you know, the reality of things is this is, happens all the time. And I'm not saying that we ever get callous to this. Uh, we certainly feel, I certainly feel all the time for the loss, the pain, and the suffering that comes from this. But to suggest that I'm surprised would be not honest, right? I mean, at this point, I, you never get used to it, but being surprised, that, I wouldn't put that into my, you know, my, my vernacular. Uh, and so I start to go back to the ant things because I'm sort of saying to myself, all right, we can see these things coming again and again. Um, and what do we do differently? So I don't want to pick on any place, but just to pick a place for a second, I decided to look at Puerto Rico for, for a while. I got a lot of good friends there, and even some family members who live in Puerto Rico, and decided to look a little bit at the history. And we know, I mean, I'm sure with most of us, if you hear about a storm is coming and it's hit Puerto Rico, our heart sinks. But are you really that surprised like you didn't hear it before, right? So, so I decided, like, I could pick any number of storms that hit Puerto Rico. I deliberately picked these dates. Notice September, September, September. Um, and more specifically, we go back a little over 100 years to around 1900. Look at that picture. The cameras weren't as good back then, but you can kind of tell. Look literally uh, almost exactly 100 years later, you know, uh, and you see a picture that kind of look gives the same exact message. And then look at the frequency going five years after that and that picture. Uh, the only thing different is the naming of the storms. Right? They started naming them because it's so, you know, frequently you have them pop up on the television. And the other thing that's different is we've gotten a lot better as responders to this, like to go out and try to help people. But how different have we actually changed things in terms of the way we, re we rebuild stuff? I mean, it, you know, we turn back around and we see the same kind of catastrophe again and again. 
when in reality what we really want is we want things to look pristine the way they are no matter what happens as best we can. It calls to question you know, my thoughts around how different we are from those ants. And, you know, and we should be. Now, speaking specifically, just focused on climate change and the natural disasters. You know, there are three components that I look at in terms of the legs of the stool and fighting climate. Two of them are talked about, the third one very rarely, in terms of the level of detail that I'm going to describe today. The first one we know we got to slow down the increase in temperature, so we got to mitigate. The second thing is just a reality for us is that we're not going to snap our fingers and have that temperature just drop back down. So we've got to learn how to adapt in the way we live. But the third one I want to define in a little, and there's a nuance to it, is, is that, and that's the resiliency. So those ants that I talked about, we know they're incredibly resilient in the sense that they're tough, right, mentally. And so are we uh, in that regard. But then let's take it to the next step. Resiliency should be in our response in the way we design products after something happens, right? So that those products themselves are resilient. Resilience should also pop up in the systems that we have, the infrastructure that we use later to replace, right? And so those three legs of the stool, we spend a lot of time on mitigation, which is my primary day job. So um, I'm 100% in support of that. Um, I'm living every day with my family this is, and friends. This is all of us, our adaptation. But resiliency as the third leg of the stool, that's the piece that makes me come back and think we have to be different than those ants. We should be able to think about how we design products, systems, and infrastructure. And particularly as we go back to the way those ants were thinking, those were not wants, those were needs that those ants were building around. And so we kind of focus on needs for a second. And so let's go to Maslow's hierarchy and let's pick two things that are unambiguously needs, like the water we drink and the food we eat. How do we design products around them that are not only important for mitigation and adaptation, but are deliberately designed for resiliency so those pictures look very different from um, place to place? I'm going to talk about two companies um, that begin to uh, give an illustrative example of what I mean by that. Let's start with water, and I'm going to talk about this company, Source Global, that the two firms that I have, Material Impact um, and Breakthrough Energy Ventures, both co-invested in. Uh, as an aside, this is also a few years ago, the Limelson Award winner at MIT uh, won it for, for the design of this product. So let's think about it a little bit, water. The water cycle is pretty basic, right? You know, precipitation comes down, the water collects, eventually it evaporates, and we come right back around and it, come, and it comes back into, um, into that full cycle. And anywhere on this cycle, any one of these four nodes is an opportunity to tap in and get drinking water, if you really think about it carefully. Now, what we typically focus on more than anything is drinking water on the ground, and you know, fresh water sources, lakes, streams, rivers, even reservoirs that we create. The reality is there's more water in the, in the air we breathe than there are on fresh water sources on land yet we do very little around designing for that. And furthermore, things on land are a lot more vulnerable, right, in terms of the way we set up our infrastructure or someone makes a bad decision and knocks something over <laughs> into a reservoir, we're in trouble. Thousands of uh, houses can end up, families can end up not having clean drinking water or worse. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the air and, and the approach that this company, Source Global, took to not only design a product that was important addressing a need like drinking water, but do it in such a way that it's resilient. So we think about a product that's out there today that we all see all the time that's pretty resilient. A solar panel is pretty resilient, if you think about it. You know, they're, they're independently addressed houses or buildings or, or, or uh, businesses. If something comes along, um, like a storm comes along and so forth, could knock one or two of these things out, but they're easily replaced. They could be redundant. So solar panels make sense, can go any part, any place in the world, part of the globe, you know, we can reach. And so imagine doing the same thing for clean drinking water, where you have something that looks like a solar panel, but can be put anywhere in the world in any site. So you're probably looking and saying, oh, you are seeing solar panels right now. Actually, we're not. We're seeing what's called hydro panels. And if you look a little bit closer, this is what Source uh, Global makes. They actually make this product that looks a lot like a solar panel, um, but if we delve into exactly the way it works, uh, we know solar panels take sunlight and, and, and captures it and, and translates that into electricity. What these hydro panels do uh, is actually take sunlight 
and air, and then the mechanism that's inside, a clever mechanical material design, actually extracts the clean drinking water out of the air and collects it. And so you can imagine in every place that you see a solar panel, which is everywhere, in any part of the globe, uh, you can imagine providing clean drinking water. And this company is on every continent other than Antarctica and in 53 different countries. And most importantly, is resilient in terms of the design of the product. So storms that come along or if people even decide to do bad things, this product is an unusual product to keep uh, water security in place. So let me talk about the next uh, you know, topic, which is food. And we're talking about another company called Pivot Bio. And this one is actually a good one in terms of a sign of the times when, in terms of some things that have happened recently in the last three years that have impacted our food security. I love ants, but I also love bees. Bees, I had this whole thing in the park that I used to run around and do. Bees are fascinating, right? When you kind of take a look at them, they're having fun in this particular picture with, with each other. But they're also incredibly important in our food supply. We know that nature, by the way, if you want to talk about resiliency, nature is already pre-programmed in resiliency if you look really carefully. I mean, it's, it's been by design. It's when typically when we get away from nature and we start coming up with our own things that human beings design that we then end up with this complex in infrastructure that's vulnerable. So if you really want to kind of think about how to learn from a design that's resilient, go back to nature and go back to, like, for example, the way bees have an impact on pollinating things. So think about the plight of the, the farms, the growers, and the farmers overall. Um, these huge, vast areas that have to help feed large communities. And you know, we're not only looking at harvesting the, uh, the, the crops, but most importantly, eventually that soil that ends up putting the nutrients into those crops ends up getting depleted. And, the farmer then has to worry. And what we've done uh, historically now is come up with complex ways with supply chains all around the world to try and address this need. It sounds good, but it's actually an incredibly vulnerable way to go about it. So this company, Pivot Bio, I want to get into by, by starting a little bit, to go, exactly what I did with water, go back to the, uh, to the cycle that's, that's typical. The major nutrient in, uh, in agriculture is nitrogen. Right, as compared to the H2O, the water that I just talked about for, for uh, source. Think about nitrogen, and really quickly, same thing. We get nitrogen out of the air, it comes down into the ground, into the soil. We have bacteria that tends to translate that when, into what's called nitrogen fixation. That is important for, for the plants that we have. Eventually that gets depleted, the nitrogen goes back in the air, and it has a general cycle that tends uh, to be uh, slow or fast, depending on what you uh, engineer in that overall cycle. Now imagine if what is required to do this are some key ingredients from Russia or some key things that have to get shipped through on you know, major boats. Pandemic comes along, we can't get that shipping stuff in. War happens and all of a sudden we can't get certain supplies. Guess what happens? Our, food, our whole food security becomes in jeopardy. And this is exactly what happened, and it, and it's still happening right, right now. Um, what Pivot Bio does is go back to nature, um, little engine that really helps pr provide nitrogen the best. Um, let's think about microbes. And so what they design are these microbes that you can put right in the hands of the farmers, that they can put into the soil, and those microbes are little engines that actually provide the nitrogen right in that soil. So the Pivot Bio designs these things, and I want you to think about if you have something like that in the hands of the farmers where those things can feed the nutrients directly into the plants, not only do you avoid that supply chain issue that I mentioned, if a big storm comes along and comes and washes stuff away, guess what it doesn't wash away? The microbes that are under the ground feeding, these, uh, feeding all of our plants and, and supplies as compared to what we typically do with manure or other types of, uh, of chemical-based processes. So Pivot Bio, just like Source uh, Global, is a company that's doing incredibly well right now because it's not only designing products that are really important, but they're designing products that are incredibly resilient. So I want to kind of have the last few slides tell you why I'm extremely hopeful about us not being like ants completely. Um, let's talk about a storm that we just recently had. 
Uh, we all remember uh, Hurricane Ian down in Florida, specifically in the Fort Myers region, right? And, uh, and I'm going to show a couple of slides. And this, is, this particular slide is the Sanibel Bridge, um, and this is, this is directly after the hurricane. Of course, the bridge got demolished to Sanibel Island. Some of you may have visited Sanibel Island before. It's a beautiful place. But nonetheless, the bridge gets knocked down. And then really quickly, my friends down there were, were fast to tell me, like, we're really proud. Guess what we did? In less than a month, we rebuilt it back. And I saw this, and I thought about the ants again, thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. You know, we're, we're back in the ants. And these are, you know, but they, they, you know, they quickly said to me, no, 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 Carmichael, Carmichael, remember um, what we told you about when you came down, and we showed you that we had built this over the last 20-something years. We built this little region adjacent um, to the greater Fort Myers area called Babcock Ranch. And, it was, and I remembered, and it, it was a pretty amazing thing that they had done, almost waiting for the hurricane to come. They had built the Babcock Ranch where they designed everything, not only to be renewable, but to be resilient. They had thought about the idea that we want to make sure that electricity doesn't go out in a storm, and we want to see if this region that we deliberately designed this way is resilient. They even designed the, the, the water systems, the sewage drainage and everything to go away from all the homes waiting and anticipating for the time that some storm would come, and lo and behold, here comes Hurricane Ian and hits the, hits the location. Amazingly, and this was on 60 Minutes, you can see it, see it um, televised, Babcock Ranch, that whole region never lost any electricity, never had any floods. Meanwhile, all the rest of the greater part of Fort Myers you know, had all sorts of damage and so forth. So of course, they had their little test area that as they begin to rebuild, they say, well, yeah, we built the bridge really quick because people want to get to Sanibel Island. But as we begin to rebuild now, we're going to take the lessons from Babcock Ranch and we're going to do things quite differently. So in, in summary, I want to talk about resiliency again, just to repeat. When I'm talking about resilient, I'm not just talking about being, about being tough mentally. I'm talking more so about being deliberate in the design of the products, the systems, the infrastructure that we do designing that resilient as the third leg of the stool, because I do believe that if we do this, in addition to the mitigation and adaptation, we will benefit from seeing things maintained in this beautiful world the way we want it, uh, with slight tweaks that we just need to have the right tech that's sitting around it. Thank you.